This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. Tucked away in Thirsk, England, is the home of one of the 20th century's most popular authors, James Alfred Alf White, who wrote under the now famous pseudonym James Harriet. On today's Preserve Cast, we're heading back across the pond to talk with Ian Ashton, the managing director of the world of James Harriet, to talk about interpreting and preserving the life and legacy of this famed 20th century author. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast today. We're thrilled to be joined by Ian Ashton, who is the managing director of the world of James Harriet, and um, is a perfect time to have this conversation, as it seems uh, the whole world is is attuned to this story and the stories um, that are enshrined in this historic house museum. So, Ian, where did you grow up, and and what led you to working in a historic house museum? Um, how, how did this all come together? Well, it's a long story, um, but I was uh, born and brought up in a town called Buxton, which is in Derbyshire, um, which is roughly the middle of the country. Um, and I was born there, and as I say, brought up, um, and um, I really have a long story to get to the point of a historic house uh, museum um, because obviously uh, and before that uh, I was in various different um, jobs. My first job was actually uh, in quarrying, quarrying limestone um, in Derbyshire and I was an assistant manager at the age of 21 and moved to the manager of the quarry at the age of 23, which I believe was recorded as being the youngest person ever to be um, in that position at the age of 23. Uh, I stayed in quarrying for a number of years and and went to various quarries, including um, quarry in Guernsey in the Channel Islands, and then returned to Leicestershire uh, in the Midlands, and then up to the northeast, which I've been for the last 40 years um, in the quarrying industry. Um, I retired um, and went into engineering, which was the background, my background, um, and set up an engineering business to uh, manif- design and manufacture uh, equipment for the quarrying industry and the coal industry screens and crushers and and things like that, conveyors, um, and developed um, a a modern business um, actually in Thirsk in North Yorkshire. Um, As time progressed, um, I worked uh, or did a lot of work for a major company called Blackwood Hodge, who were at that time the world's um, largest uh, earth moving equipment hire uh, in the country um, and they uh, decided that they would like to have uh, a production um, to export equipment abroad. Um, after that, about two years time, unfortunately they went bust um, and I finished up buying the business back again. The company was called um, Crushing and Screening Limited. So I bought the, the rights back to, to re- start to produce again. And um, after a couple of years, I decided to retire again. And my son has taken over the business and runs it successfully up to this date. So that brings me up to um, retirement. And in my retirement, I decided to um, look at uh, a small business that I knew basically nothing about, which was a falconry centre, uh, Birds of Prey, um, and decided to get involved with it, rightly or wrongly, but did enjoy it um, and developed it and built it up to a very successful, possibly one of the most successful ones in the country, um, and uh, enjoyed it extremely for three years um, and then decided to 
decided again to retire um, and finished up then um, basically uh, in a retirement state. Uh, and then one day got a call from the leader of the council in, in, in um, Hamilton, which is the area where first is, um, and asked me if I was interested in getting involved with the world of James Herriot, which was not being very successful at the time, and they were thinking of closing it. Um, and that was um, in 2012, which um, I obviously decided to get involved in, and put, a, put a, a business plan together, which they accepted um, and we set sail then as a private limited company with the world of James Herriot. And that was in 2012, and it brings us up to date. So that's got to be one of the most circuitous routes to running a historic house museum. I don't think we've <laughs> met anyone else who uh, started in the quarrying business and ended up running a house museum. And it also seems like you're a serial retirer. You just you retire, yeah. and then you keep getting brought out of retirement for the next thing. Um, so fascinating, um, step. So let's take a step back though. So for listeners who aren't familiar with James Harriet, and obviously that's a pseudonym, so we'll have to get, get to know who the real person was. Who was he and why has he continued to sort of capture the imagination and, and hearts of, of readers and audiences around the world? Who, who is this person and, and why should people care about him? Well, it, it, um, James Harriet is not his real name. His real right. name is Alf White. And I, as a vet, um, he could not use his own name to promote whatever he was doing. So he then had to find a name um, in the records of the, the veterinary uh, people that didn't have uh, any connection. And he was actually at a, a football match watching a cup game um, which was between Birmingham City uh, and Manchester United. Um, and there was a gentleman playing in goal called Jim Herriot. And he was having a fantastic game against Manchester United and all the greats in those days. And so Alf quickly looked in his book and lo and behold, there wasn't a name there called <laughs> Jim Herriot. So that's how he got his name. And then, obviously, he was in, in um, veterinary in Thirsk, having been born in Sunderland um, in 1916. Uh, and when he was three weeks old, he went to Scotland with his parents. And his father worked in the shipyards. He was a plater in the shipyards uh, and worked there. He was three weeks old when he went to Scotland. Um, and um, eventually he came back to Sunderland, um, where uh, he obviously was born um, and lived there um, for a short period of time um, and then finished up in moving to Thirsk, having passed all his exams to be a veterinary surgeon. And from there, obviously, he was at Thirsk, um, where the original surgery is, which where, is where I'm speaking from now. And uh, he obviously then was a young vet, um, learning the trade um, and being very successful. So that brought us to the stage of him being a vet and resurgent. And um, he then progressed to be probably the most famous vet in the world, but not through his veterinary work, but through his books, which obviously started with it should, the um, first book, um, which was, uh, now I've lost it, um, All Creatures Great and Small. That, that is basically the story of, of, of him arriving back at, or in Thirsk uh, and becoming a bed resurgent. And what what inspired him to start writing? Was he was he always a good writer, but just went the route of being a veterinarian, or did he become? Was he just naturally inclined to be a great writer? Well, he, he 
always said that he wanted to write uh, books about his experiences with, with, with in, in the veterinary trade. Um, and apparently his wife um, had been nagging him and nagging him and saying, you will never write a book um, because you, you, you're not you're getting down to it. And apparently he turned around and said, right, I'm off to the shop to get a load of paper and I'm going to start writing. And that's where he started basically putting pen to paper. And that's in many ways the way he became the most famous vet in, in the world. So let's talk about the house that you preserve. When was the decision made to preserve it? What led to that? And what kind of a structure are we talking about? How big is it? When was it built? And what has it been restored to? Well, it, the, the house is a, obviously was a, a surgery and also living quarters for um, the vets. But it's a three-story building, um, brick building. I don't know the age of it, but it will be considerably old. It's one of the oldest buildings in, in Thirsk. Um, and it, it was then as a, a family home um, and was set up like that, including the, the um, rooms for the interviews with people with animals that are sick. Um, and of course, in those days, um, the, the main call for a vet was basically to a farm to look after or, 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 or treat large animals. Um, and then things changed considerably. Um, and it went to small animals, cats, dogs. Um, and the, 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 there was very little parking facilities outside the surgery. Um, so they decided that they would move to a purpose-built surgery on the industrial estate at Thursk. At that point, um, the property was sold and the council, Hamilton District Council, bought the property with a view to keeping it um, going because of the famous books or the famous um, writings that Alf White had done with his eight books that were sold in millions around the world. And so at that point, um, the, the actual property was, was bought by council. And uh, um, in uh, 19, uh, 1990, uh, 19, late 1990, um, the council decided then to open, well, do a lot of work to it and to make it into an attraction. Um, and uh, they opened the, uh, the attraction in Thirsk in the year 2000. And, and since it's opened, what, what's been the reception? You know, is there been a leveling off? Is there a continuing fascination? It seems like every new generation kind of falls back in love with all creatures great and small and, and the stories of James Harriet. Um, it has, has, has interest been stable? Is there a plan to try and keep it stable? You know, you talked about your business plan. What did that focus on in order to kind of make the success that it's become today? Well, what we've had to do um, is run it as a private entity, which is, is, is totally different to the way councils run businesses. Um, and um, the reason, obviously, it was uh, not making profit was because the numbers had gone down. The, the actual um, attraction museum, as it was called in those days, um, the, the interest had been lost because the marketing hadn't been done. And hence, it was in a position um, that it was losing a lot of money. So the council decided to um, go private. And at that point, I was asked to put a business plan together, um, which I did, and it was accepted by the council. At that point, then um, the marketing side of the business was done as a private entity. So you, you. You, you had a completely different outlook as to how to market um, and go out and get people to come and to advertise and promote wherever you could and, and, and widen the field of, 
of effort uh, in, in making sure that the name got out in front of people. There was a generation gap, um, which was probably the major problem, where uh, the older generation knew all about uh, all creatures great and small. The younger generation had never seen it on television except for recordings. So there was a, a gap there of the younger generation attending or visiting the what was the museum. The thing that I changed immediately um, when I, I was involved was to call it an attraction and take away the name museum because I think that gave a false impression about what it was. It was an attraction. It was an attraction that wanted young children to come and have a look at it and see it and revisit the name All Creatures Rain Small. Um, we obviously did that by advertising, promoting young uh, people to it. Um, and the numbers which had fallen drastically um, prior to it going into private uh, entity started to climb. And we've been fortunate in the sense that the marketing that we put into it has given us increased numbers year on year, where prior to COVID, we were on just short of 40,000 visitors a year. And that's taking it from around about 20,000 visitors when it became a private company. So we, we turn it around from that point of view but also, one of the other major factors is, of course, that there has been a television programme called the Yorkshire Vet, which has been tremendously successful. And on the back of that, we have picked up the younger element because they've been seeing how the modern vets work. Uh, and it has been a, a tremendous success. And it's based on the world of James Herriot. Um, there has been filming in here. The front of the building is always on the opening credits um, and it's referred to by the two vets that are involved in it. Um, one was an understudy for Alf White, uh, James Herriot. Um, so he had first hand uh, information as to what went off in those days. Um, and he took up the mantle to basically promote Thursk and all creatures great and small through the Yorkshire Bear. Well, this is a good place for us to take a quick break, then come back, talk about what's coming up next, um, what uh, people could see in the, in the greater Thursk region, and uh, we'll talk about all that when we come back on PreserveCast. Historic preservation can't happen without skilled tradespeople to perform the work, and there's a critical need right now for those tradespeople. The Campaign for Historic Trades, powered by Preservation Maryland, is working to meet that need by strengthening apprenticeship opportunities within historic trades. In partnership with the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center and Conservation Legacy, the campaign is currently recruiting for NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, or TTAP. TTAP is an intensive 20-week apprenticeship that provides young adults the chance to learn historic trade skills while working on America's most iconic historic sites. Multiple positions are open for the 2022 season at national parks across the country. Visit historictrades.org for more information on TTAP and how to apply today. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to Preserve Cast. Today, we're joined by Ian Ashton, who is the managing director of the world of James Harriet. We've been talking all about the work that they've done to increase visitation and engage with different audiences. Uh, and before we took our break, we were talking about how they've increased visitation and sort of the growing interest in this, uh, thanks to um, the marketing that they've done, but also um, new television shows that have featured this story. Um, do you do a lot of special programming projects and, and what do you have that's kind of coming up uh, when it comes to that now that we're coming out of the pandemic or at least the, the restrictions are being lifted? The main thing now um, is the new uh, All Creatures Great and Small uh, series, which is being filmed 
uh, and is shown in America, um, has been shown in America, the first series, and I think that has been a phenomenal success. I understand something like 10 million viewers on the first night of all creatures great and small in America. That is a marketplace that we are now um, honing into because we obviously think that that will be a tremendous future market for us when all the COVID restrictions are lifted and people can fly free to uh, or, uh, not, uh, not have the COVID restrictions uh, to this country. And again, that will um, generate a, a marketplace which we are sadly missing at the moment. Yeah, and obviously we're, we're reaching that market right now. So I guess one of the questions is, uh, if people are thinking about making the trip, um, I don't think a lot of people, or at least a lot of our listeners, are probably familiar with Thirsk and the region. So tell us a little bit about if, if you're making a trip there and you were going to come see the world of James Harriet, what else could they do to sort of extend the visit? Are there other things in the area that are worthwhile to see? Can you make sort of a, a visit and an experience um, coming to see that region? Or is there is there a lot to see in that area? We have obviously picked up on exactly that comment that you've made. And we have formed a new company um, called Harriet Country Tourism Group. And that is um, the Harriet Country area and all the good things in that area that people can see and visit. And um, it, it involves a number of attractions, hotels, guest houses, views, gardens, uh, stately homes. Um, and at the moment, we are uh, looking to have somewhere in the region of a thousand members. So that will be available on a, a website that we have just produced. Um, it will then obviously have something to offer people who want to come to, the con to this country for maybe two, three weeks. And we can put itineraries together for them for interesting places to visit and do. And, and how do you, what's the best way to get there? What, what's the closest airport? How do you travel in? That kind of thing. If people are listening and are kind of thinking through how they might get to uh, that region, how, how is it connected to the rest of, of England or places, places that Americans might be familiar with? Well, we're very fortunate. Obviously, there is London um, Airport, Manchester Airport, and I think there are direct flights uh, to uh, both those airports from America. Um, we then have a very good uh, train service from London and Manchester. Uh, London is only two hours, just over two hours away by train um, to Thirsk, which only stops on one particular line. It only stops at York and then stops at Thirsk. So the, the, you haven't got the problems of stopping at different places all the way up. Um, and also across from Manchester, uh, there is a direct link into Thirsk from Manchester. So we, we're well placed with flight and pe people coming in on flights. So it's a, it's a perfect place to visit. And as people are thinking through, um, you know, these sort of post-pandemic trips, it seems like it's a great place to kind of come together. And we'll put links in the show notes to all the different sites that Ian has been mentioning and, and ways of sort of extending your trip. If you decide to make the visit, um, the worthwhile visit to Thirsk and to see the world of James Harriet. So before we go, the last question we ask of everyone, uh, beyond the world of James Harriet, what is your favorite historic place or site? I think um, the, 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 the scenery in Yorkshire, um, in the Dales and on the moors is just outstanding. And in the summer months, well, today is a beautiful day. There's a completely blue sky. The, the scenery, um, from touring around, especially where the new series has been filmed, which is a place called Grassington. And that is up the Dales. And if you drive from Thirsk to Grassington, the scenery is completely stunning. Um, I have done it many times and I still cannot get over how beautiful um, and different the landscape is. 
So from that point of view, it, it, it's a wonderful part of the world. And there are so many, so many places to visit Castle Howard, uh, York, Minster, uh, to name it too. But the, there are virtually hundreds of attractions um, to visit some excellent hotels. Um, it is just a wonderful county to visit. Well, you've you've definitely sold it, and uh, I'm I'm ready to to get my my ticket and come over and visit. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, getting to hear about how you've put together the story, and and really um, been able to expand the audience and the understanding of this fascinating and fantastic author. Um, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, hope to come and visit you someday soon. You'll be very welcome, and thank you too. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.